let's turn together in our Bibles to the prophet Zephaniah. So if you have a Bible, um, the Old Testament comes first, the New Testament comes second. So in the Old Testament, there are uh, these writings called the Minor Prophets, the very end of the Old Testament, uh, and one of those is called Zephaniah. So uh, if you want to find that and turn there with me, just three chapters. Um, we've been, uh, oh, thanks, George. We've been for, uh, for quite a while going through uh, the story of the Bible, and we're now in these Minor Prophets, and uh, as you're looking at the Old Testament, it goes from Genesis all the way to Malachi, uh, I've mentioned that there's different order for the, for the English Bible versus uh, the Christian Bible versus the, the Jewish Bible. Uh, and these minor prophets correlate to, uh, earlier in the Bible, to the book of Second Kings. And so uh, just kind of note that um, they're not actually the last things that happen, but uh, they're, 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 they're correlated to the time of the king. So uh, Zephaniah, uh, three chapters I mentioned uh, this morning, I uh, encourage you to read ahead. I don't know if you had a chance to, but uh, just three chapters, and I, and I kind of find myself, uh, whenever we have a long book, um, you know, I feel like I'm kind of like right in that 30-minute uh, sweet spot. When I get to three chapters, you just, it's like you, you want to say it all, you know? Uh, there's, there's only three chapters. I, I, can, I can get to this whole thing. So uh, bear with me. We'll do, we'll do our best to, uh, to summarize it. There's a quick little sermon notes page. It doesn't have a lot of notes on it this, uh, this evening, but uh, I'll help you fill that in as we go along if you'd like to uh, take notes and then also uh, just some questions uh, at the bottom as well. So uh, we turn to Zephaniah, and as we go through it, I'll point out some passages. We'll look at some verses and, and uh, kind of help you summarize, you know, what this prophet is all about. And like many of the prophets, it's called, uh, it's described as the word of the Lord that came to Zephaniah. And then he's described there as a son of uh, a certain man and during the reign of certain kings. So uh, this is the word of the Lord that came to him. Uh, and then he therefore spoke that word and prophesied that word. Uh, we speak of prophets. Sometimes we think of prophets only as those kind of like they're fortune tellers. Uh, they, they, they predict things that are going to happen in the future. Uh, they're more than just predictors, they're preachers. And so that's really what we see here. Uh, he's not just foretelling or telling the future, but he's also foretelling. He's proclaiming a message to these ancient people. So just notice there, if you'd like to take notes, chapter 1, 1 to 2, 3. Uh, this is a, a little scene of a day of judgment. So the first thing the prophet, right out of the, right out of the shoot, uh, a day of judgment. So this is you know, pretty heavy going uh, right from the beginning. And he says there in verse 2, I will utterly sweep away everything from the face of the earth. So this, uh, this very wide-ranging, universal judgment that's coming. But notice in verse 3, there's this creational kind of language there. Uh, and it emphasizes just how comprehensive this coming judgment is going to be. So again, look at verse number 3. I will sweep away man and beast. So just kind of underline that, man and beast. I will sweep away the birds of the heavens and the fish of the sea. So notice human beings, animals, uh, the created beings in the sky, birds, uh, and fish, the things that are under the earth. So we have all the various levels of creation, the heavens, uh, the earth, and uh, we have the things under the earth, so-called, uh, in the water, uh, and the rubble with the wicked. I will cut off mankind from the face of the earth. Now, when God, way back when in the book of Genesis, sent judgment upon the world in the days of Noah, what is called the flood of Noah, uh, which parts of creation were destroyed? Which parts of the, of the animal creational kingdom was destroyed? Everything not in the ark. Okay, good. Um, but what about the fish? <laughs> they already were living, living it up in the waters. But it's, so it's interesting here uh, that in this judgment, I, I think by the inclusion of the fish are going to be swept away. It's, in other words, it's saying that the judgment is going to be even worse than the floods. All the realms and all the kinds of animal kingdoms uh, and so forth, they're all going to be wiped off the face of the planet. There's this great day of judgment coming. But the prophet's speaking this to the ancient people of Judah. That's the southern kingdom. Uh, and by saying this, he wasn't trying to say to the Judahites, those in the southern kingdom, you know, now it's time for you to throw stones at the world in this sort of 
holier than thou kind of an attitude that God is coming to judge and, and we can just simply look out and, and see the world and laugh. No. Zephaniah ministered, as we see the, in verse 1, uh, in the days of Hezekiah, Josiah, and so forth, uh, uh, the days of Josiah, excuse me, uh, king of Judah. We read about him in 2 Kings 21 to 23. He's one of the good kings, one of the more famous kings who revived uh, the people of God and, and, and true worship. Uh, the northern kingdom of Israel had already been destroyed. And in the days of Josiah, there was a great reformation. Worship was restored, worship was reformed, uh, people came back to the Lord. But we read in that story, though, that no matter how many reforms Josiah, King Josiah, uh, accomplished, wickedness ran rampant through God's kingdom. And so the prophet saying that that judgment is coming still, it's already come upon the north, right? The Assyrians came through, and now it's going to come upon the south. The Babylonians are going to come too. Notice that he saves his most graphic proclamation for the people of God. So everything's going to be destroyed, but notice in verses 4 and 6, he's much, much more pointed towards, we might say, the church, towards the people of of God. I will stretch out my hand against Judah. That's the people of God there. And against all the inhabitants of Jerusalem. So Judah is this whole region and Jerusalem is the capital city. You know, it's like the creme de la creme. Of, it's, that's where the people of God uh, who were closest to God's temple and to God's presence, that's where they live. God is going to stretch out his hand against them. Stretch out his hand. Where do we read that in the Bible? I will stretch out my hand against say the Egyptians, right? This is Exodus. This is, this is Exodus language. But while it once was used to describe God stretching out his hand and bringing the Israelites out of Egypt, now it's being described in terms of judgment. I'm going to stretch out my hand against them in judgment. Why would God judge his own people? I mean, why would God judge his own people? We, we can understand that God's going to judge you know, those people out there. But why would he judge his own people? Look at verses 4 through 6. I'm just going to point out a couple of things here. Uh, Judah was full of the remnant of Baal. This is the god of the Canaanites. Idolatrous priests who were bowing down on their rooftops to the host of the heavens. They were worshiping stars. Who bowed down and swear to the Lord and yet swear by Milcom. So they were trying to serve God and to serve themselves and serve mammon, as Jesus said. Try to have two masters at once. And so it was time for judgment to begin at the household of God. And so God was bringing judgment upon them. Now, this judgment of the Babylonians was only a little preview of what is coming upon the whole world. God's ancient judgments were never just merely for them. They were, they were also prophetic of the final judgment. But notice again that this should strike us as the people of God. That when we say that Jesus is coming again to judge both the living and the dead... We have to always take that to heart that in the here and the now, as the New Testament says, it's time for judgment to begin at the house of God. The church has believers and unbelievers. The church has weeds as well as wheat. There are goats among the sheep. And we have to be warned about that. And we have to always be on guard as pastors and elders and to be diligent as the people of God that we're not infected with a false understanding of worship and who God is. We have to be on guard that the judgment should begin first at the house of God. Now, we may not have the same kinds of idols, and we may not have the same kinds of, uh, uh, of idolatrous practices as these ancient people in Judah, but we can still think of God in these kinds of idolatrous ways, can't we? Sometimes we view God like an ATM machine. You know, if I just would pray the right things and say the right things and maybe do the right sort of little acts of service and whatnot, maybe I can get out of God like an ATM machine what I need at the, at the right time. We might view the church. We might view the preaching and the sacraments. We had baptism this morning. We had Holy Communion and, and we pray and we sing. But we might view them sort of like we would view a, the, the new drive through Starbucks right at the end of uh, Highway 76 uh, and Coast Highway, right? You know, I can drive in and I can get what I need. It's convenient. It's just there. You know, I pay a few dollars. It used to be like, four, we called it four bucks. Now it's five bucks. Now it's getting closer to six bucks. But it's Starbucks, right? All the same. 
And we can view God like this, sort of as a drive-through commodity, and he's there just when we need him. Zephaniah describes judgment. He goes on to describe, and I won't belabor it, but he goes on to describe there in verses 7 to 18, uh, this day of judgment in great detail. Just notice that verse 7, be silent before the Lord God, for the day of the Lord is near. Sometimes when our kids are arguing, uh, parents, we, we've known this, our kids are arguing, and sometimes it takes mom and dad to come in to separate the two, or the three or the four, however, however, however many we might have, to, to bring some calmness, but yet they keep arguing, they keep fighting, dad's in the middle, you know, playing referee, and they're still yelling over dad, and sometimes you just got to say, silence! God's trying to humble Judah here. He's humbling them. Be silent. The day of the Lord is near. Now, even after all that, the end of this chapter of one and the beginning of chapter two, they've not turned back. They didn't heed the warnings. Zephaniah calls them in chapter two, verse three, to seek the Lord. Yet they didn't. Seek the Lord, seek righteousness, seek humility. Perhaps you may be hidden on the day of, ang of the anger of the Lord. So there's a judgment coming upon them. It's a, it prefigures the judgment that's coming upon the whole world at the end of human history. And notice the remedy to that, just quickly. Notice the remedy to that. God is bringing judgment upon the earth. What's the remedy? What's the out? What's the way out of being judged, according to the prophet? Seek the Lord, right? Seek the Lord. The Lord who's bringing judgment is the one that we've got to seek. We flee from the wrath of God by fleeing to God. We flee from the wrath of Jesus Christ who's coming to judge both living and dead by seeking Jesus Christ. We hide from judgment by hiding ourselves in the one who is the judge. We're saved by God, from God, by God, in other words. We're saved from God, by God. And that is why he sent his son, Jesus, to this earth. So that we can seek the Lord and find in the Lord refuge. To find in him forgiveness. To find in him salvation. To find in him recreation, renewal, restoration. Seek the Lord, he says. Seek the Lord. So there's this day of judgment coming. But then notice in chapter 2, verse 4, to chapter 3, verse number 8, that the prophet also describes this day of conquest. And I'll just quickly mention this, a day of conquest, because I want to get towards the end here. But in more detail, he then, sort of in a second prophetic cycle here, he explains in greater detail this worldwide judgment and you see it in chapter 2, verse number 4. Uh, it begins with this little word, for, for. He's connecting this previous prophetic cycle with now this new one. He's going to give more detail. And he describes this day of the Lord like a new conquest of the promised land with a new Joshua, the Lord himself. So we go back in our Bibles to the book of Joshua. There was the conquest, they entered the promised land. Uh, they dispossessed all the nations, and they did so through their leader, Joshua, the successor of Moses. But yet, there's a new conquest coming. There's entrance into the promised land. There's conquest over all these enemies of God. But the, the new Joshua is the Lord himself. Who do you think that Lord himself is, brothers and sisters? <laughs> Who's the new Joshua? Jesus, right? So this is an Old Testament prophet, but we're getting to see like those little shadows uh, and these little previews of what's going to come. We're going to see here Jesus coming to us, uh, ultimately. And he describes the, all these enemies, uh, chapter 2, verses 4 to 7. They're on the west side uh, of the promised land. There are the Philistines. Uh, on the east side, there are the Moabites and the Ammonites, verses 8 through 11. Uh, down south, there's Cush, that's Egypt, that's verse 12. And then you have to the north, you have the Assyrians, who've already come into uh, the northern part of the kingdom, verses 13 through 15. So all these enemies are in the land, they're around the land, and the Lord himself is going to come, and he's going to flush them all out. They're all going to exit out, all these ungodly nations. 
But it's, again, it's more than just all those enemies out there that are going to be punished. The Lord also speaks of, of ungodly people within, within Judah. Within, we say, the covenant people. When God comes to judge, it's not just to judge enemies out there, but again, inside, inside. And he saves, the prophet does, his most powerful words for those who are merely, we we would say, members, outwardly members of the church, those who are attenders of the church, uh, those who just inquire or who might just kind of be visitors, who might be kind of interested to see what's going on every once in a while and pop in, as I mentioned, you know, like a Starbucks, whenever you're able to. In other words, he's writing in this section of the prophecy, chapter 2, verse 4 to 3, verse 8, uh, to those who are in the realm of the church, who are within the body of the church, but who have no true, living, saving faith. Look at chapter 3, verse 1. Woe to her who is rebellious and defiled the oppressing city. He's describing Jerusalem there. Woe to her who was rebellious and defiled, the oppressing city. Now, the oppressing city, we would think, is Nineveh or or various cities of the the Assyrians, the Babylonians. The oppressing city is Jerusalem. They were shaking their heads and they're pumping their fists against all those ungodly people out there, forgetting that they themselves were doing the same thing. He's speaking of his own people. Notice how he describes the the southern kingdom of Judah uh, when he says in verse number two, she listens to no one. She accepts no correction. Didn't, didn't Didn't King Solomon say in the proverb I read tonight that it's the wise person, it's the godly person who accepts correction and discipline? But here's the people of God. She listens to no one. She accepts no correction. And pastors down the ages has, could, can, can confidently say, you know, I couldn't have said it more confidently myself. A person who's hard-hearted, whose ears are stopped up, who has gone astray and just won't listen anymore. She listens to no one. She accepts no correction. Now, if this is true of a person within the body of the Lord, how much worse so is it for those outside? She does not trust in the Lord, verse 2. She does not draw near to her God. And then he goes on to even more strikingly, more strongly, to bring condemnation upon the leaders, the leaders of the people of God. And there are these warnings and there are these harsh words against them, but how did Judah respond? Look at chapter 3, verse 7. Chapter 3, verse 7. Here's sort of the end of, of all these warnings, all this judgment, all this prophecy but all the more they were eager to make all their deeds corrupt. They would not hear. They would not listen. They would not be changed. They would not be converted. So that's the bad news. A lot of bad news. First chapter, uh, two two plus chapters, one, one to three, eight. A lot of judgment, a lot of condemnation, not just of a judgment against the world that's coming, but the church needs to hear that the church must judge itself. We must judge ourselves on the basis of what God says in his word before that final judgment comes. But yet, in those days, they wouldn't be converted. They wouldn't hear. And so the Lord then promises good news. The good news is that there is a day coming of conversion. He says. Notice chapter 3, verse 9 to 3, uh, 3, verse 9 down to verse 13. There is a day coming of conversion. All these warnings, all this judgment, all this sadness, all this harshness spoken against the covenant people of the Judahites who had the temple, who had Jerusalem, who had the kingship, yet they would not change their ways. And so the Lord says, You know what? I'm going to bring a day of conversion, I'm going to bring change. You won't change, but I'm going to do it for you. And so he describes the gospel blessings, ultimately, of what Jesus Christ has 
come to do 600 years or so before Jesus Christ even came. So when you're in chapter 3 at the end here, verse 9 to the end, you've got to read these words in the light and through the lens of what we know in the New Testament. This is describing a day to come, a day of salvation. Even before these things could be understood. And, it, and, and there are ways in which the prophet describes here that he doesn't quite say it exactly how the New Testament says it, but he says it in other ways. It's sort of like uh, 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 I was talking to, uh, to Reverend Jefferson this morning, and uh, I, was remind, I was reminiscing with him about a certain uh, a Brazilian dessert uh, that, that I was offered up many years ago down in Brazil. And uh, they, they offered me this dessert, and I said, you know, well, what is this dessert? And they say it's called cupassu. And, and I said, well, what's it like? You know, what does it taste like? And they kind of laughed because Americans hate this Brazilian dessert, cupassu. And so I said, well, what is it, what's it like? And uh, they said, well, you know, it's, first of all, this is like a traditional uh, northern Brazilian candy, um, which didn't really register much with me because I'm not from the northern part of Brazil. And so, you know, well, what's it like? And so the translator was trying to get a, give me a sense of what it was like. He said, well, it's kind of like white chocolate. So imagine that. It's kind of like white chocolate, but it's not as smooth as white chocolate. Okay, so it's like white chocolate, but not as smooth. It actually looks like white chocolate, but it's not as smooth as white chocolate. Uh, another person said, well, it's kind of like pineapple to you. It's like pineapple, but it's less sweet than pineapple. So I don't even know how to imagine that, but it's like pineapple, but not quite as sweet. Uh, it's like banana, but less mushy. Okay, like banana, but less mushy. So in other words, trying to describe to someone who has no concept of what kupasu is, uh, by describing it in things that I would understand, but they're not quite those very same things. I, of course, of course uh, you know, I, I tried it. Uh, absolutely loved it, and uh, everybody was you know, mesmerized. This American, this gringo, uh, likes kupwasu. He's the first guy ever to come down here uh, and like this dessert. So uh, like pineapple, less sweet. Like banana, less mushy. Like white chocolate, uh, less smooth. So try to imagine that, and uh, maybe one of these days I can, I'll, I'll, get, I'll get a batch, and uh, we'll enjoy it together. So uh, the prophet's trying to describe to ancient people Things that they can't quite comprehend yet, but in ways that they can try to get a sense. You know, it's like this, but it's not quite like that. That's what we see here in this, in this prophet, where he's, he's, he, he is prophesying of a day to come. The blessings of Jesus Christ. But yet in Old Testament ways, in 600 years before Jesus came, in those kinds of Old Testament ways. And so he describes that there's a day to come in which God's going to convert and change their words. The very things that they say. Verse 9 of chapter 3. I will change the speech of the peoples to a pure speech. Because earlier he's been talking about how they've been taking these vows and they're worshiping these, these idols, these stars, these false gods. But he's going to change their words to be a pure speech. A pure speech. Uh, why? Notice for, again verse 9, the purpose of it is that all of them may call upon the name of the Lord and serve him with one accord. No longer being double-minded, trying to serve God and Milcom at the same time. God of the stars, God and Baal, God of themselves, whatever it might be. That's describing conversion. Right? A person who's double-minded, who's, who, who even wants to or pretends to want to serve God, at the same time serving themselves throughout all these various idols that we, that we do every single day. The Lord's saying, no, there's a day to come in which I'm going to convert them. I'm going to change their hearts to serve me only. Notice also that he's going to change their deeds. You see that in verse number 11. Uh, not just changing their speech to a pure speech, but uh, putting that, those, those, those words into action. Uh, uh, instead of his people being put to shame, verse 11, because of the deeds by which you've rebelled against me, the Lord's going to convert them from their evil deeds. So look at the contrast between verse 11 uh, and verse number 12. Uh, you won't be put to shame because of the deeds by which you've rebelled against me. For then, I will, for, for then I will remove from your midst your proudly exultant ones, and you should no longer be haughty in my holy mountain, uh, so on and so forth. And he describes there that he's removing, verse, thir, uh, verse 11, removing from their midst this, this, this haughtiness, this arrogance on his holy mountain. So if you're an ancient Israelite, what's atop the holy mountain? 
If you're living in Judah in the year 600 BC, what's on top of Mount Zion? What's there? The temple. What's the temple? Whose house? God's house. What's God like again? Holy, holy, holy. Who could go into the Holy of Holies? High priests. Only, only the high priests, right? Could all the priests go? Just the high priests. How many times did he go? Every day? Once a year, right? And just like for an instance, sprinkle some blood, get in there, get out of there, right? On that holy mountain, there were arrogant people, right? This is a way of describing their sin. Arrogant people. God was going to remove from their midst those people. Why? Because it's a holy mountain. It's where God lives. It's where God dwells. And so he's using this imagery to describe for them the things that we even heard this morning in Ephesians chapter 2. You were once dead in your trespasses and sins. You once walked according to the world, uh, this, this world's age. You once walked according to the power of the air, the prince that has now worked in the sons of disobedience. You were once children of wrath. That's what he's saying. I'm going to remove from your midst those, those kinds of acts, those kinds of sins, and I'm going to transform your lives. Have you ever stopped to think where you'd be if Jesus Christ hadn't invaded your life? Where would you be tonight? Would you even be alive? That's the grace and mercy of God. I will remove from your midst so there will no longer be these haughty people on my holy mountain. And all those left behind would be a holy remnant. He describes them in verse number 12. A people humble and lowly, right? In contrast to being haughty and arrogant. Who seek refuge, verse 12, in the name of the Lord. And the most, most amazing is how he describes them in verse number 13. They shall know uh, do no injustice in the, uh, 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 and speak no lies, nor shall there be found in their mouth a deceitful tongue. How is that true? No injustice, no lies, no deceit. How is that true? I mean, aren't we still sinners as believers? Yes, we are in Christ. We are in Christ, but in our, our position as believers is to be in Christ and we're found in him and all that he is is ours and all that he has done is, is ours. But yet we all know, practically speaking, that we still struggle, we still sin. And so for an ancient Jewish person to understand what it looked like and sounded like to be converted was to say there's going to be no more injustice, no more lies, no more deceit. They're going to be utterly transformed and change. And that brings us to the last thing here. So there's this day of judgment coming. It's a universal judgment. It's a judgment even upon the people of God. But yet God is going to bring conversion, a day of conversion, a day of change, uh, a day of 180 degree uh, transformation. That's what God does for us when we come to Jesus Christ and we, and, we, and we call upon his name. He transforms us. He changes us. He converts us. And it's described in these very wonderful ways here. But then notice in verses 13, uh, chapter 3, verses 14 to 20, the very end, there's going to be a day of singing, he says, a day of singing. And it all begins by simply saying, sing aloud, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O Israel. Rejoice and exult with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. We all should know by experience, it's one thing to say our praise to God, but it's quite another to sing it. That's one thing to say, praise the Lord. Another thing to sing it out to God with joy and with awe and wonder. Why sing? Why, why does he say sing aloud, shout, rejoice, exult? Notice verse 15, the Lord has taken away the judgments against you. The judgments against you. And this Hebrew term for taking away uh, speaks of annulling a legal verdict against you. In other words, those who are, uh, who, are, who are described as being guilty, who are charged and who are tried and who are then sentenced as guilty, that guilty charge is annulled. It's forgiven. It's wiped away. It's put to an end. Sing. Why? Because the Lord's going to end. He's going to annul the judgments of God against you. I mean, that enough is a reason to sing, isn't it? There is therefore now no condemnation 
for those who are in Christ Jesus. Amen? No condemnation. Sing. Shout. Rejoice. Exalt. Verse 15. Again, the Lord has cleared away your enemies. Another reason. The Lord has cleared away your enemies. Why sing? Verse number 16. The King of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst. The presence of God. And for Judah, that was signified again in the temple upon Mount Zion, there in the center of the promised land, that high point. And the, pro- the, the presence of God was there. But yet so amazingly and so wonderfully as the prophet was speaking to them 600 years before, in the fullness of times, in the fullness of time. The God who made the world, who's called the Word, all things came through the Word. God spoke and all things came to be. And the Word became flesh and tabernacled or dwelt amongst us. Sing, shout, rejoice, exalt the King of glory, the Lord Jesus Christ. But the power of His Holy Spirit is in your midst. You shall never again, verse 15 and 16 says, therefore, you shall never again fear evil. Fear not, O Zion. Let not your hands grow weak. You shall never again fear evil because the Lord is in your midst. You've got Jesus Christ, brothers and sisters. You've got Jesus Christ. That's all you need. That's all you need. Jesus is sufficient. He dwells in you he walks beside you he puts his arms around you you have jesus christ fear not he's in your midst rejoice shout exult sing and again he says why to sing in verses 18 and 19 i will gather those of you who mourn for the festival so that you will no longer suffer reproach behold at that time i will deal with all of your oppressors imagine hearing that as an ancient judahite Feeling beat down by all those enemies on the north, the south, the east, the west. Yet the Lord says, I'm going to clear them away. I will deal with all of your oppressors. And hasn't God done that for us in Jesus Christ? Didn't Paul again say this morning in Ephesians chapter 2 that you were dead? That you did once walk according to the world? That you did once walk according to Satan's ways? God has dealt in Jesus Christ upon the cross and by the empty tomb. He's already dealt with all of your oppressors. Do you believe that? Do you believe that? Your sins are wiped away, past, present, and future. Every single one of them. The world cannot hold you sway. The world cannot do anything to come against you and to come between you and Jesus Christ. The devil himself, he cannot possess you. The devil cannot cause you to lose your salvation. The devil sought to sift Peter like we, but only because Jesus permitted him to do so. We are kept in the hand of the Father, Jesus said, and we are kept in the hand of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. God is greater than the world. God is greater than our sins. God is greater than the devil. You cannot lose this wonderful salvation. And so sing, he says. Shout, exult, rejoice. Why? Again, verse number 19. I will save the lame. I will gather the outcast. I will change their shame into praise and renown in all the earth. Notice that he would gather the outcast. That's certainly what God has done for us in Christ. Not many wise, not many mighty, not many high, not many powerful, but God has chosen the weak things, the despised things, the lowly things. He's chosen you. He's chosen you. That's what God has done. He's drawn you to himself. And so at that time, the Lord says here, so amazingly, not only is he calling out to the the ancient Judahites and to us to sing for all these wonderful reasons, but then he says this. Notice at the very end. He describes the, the, this reality that the Lord himself in our midst, a mighty one who will save, he will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love, verse 17. And did you see the end of verse 17? So verse 14 is a command to us. Sing, shout, rejoice, exult. 
And the Lord's going to be in your midst one day, he says. This mighty one to save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. But then what does it say at the very end of verse 17? He will do what? He will exult over you with what? Loud singing. What a wonderful thing this is. The God who is mighty to save us is also humble to sing. Our God's arm is mighty and his mouth is filled with a melody. What's that melody about? You. You. Sinner saved by grace. A sinner saved by grace. In the ages to come, we saw this morning, in the ages to come, God is going to, as it were, display you as a trophy of his grace, of his grace. But he is mighty to save. He will rejoice over you. Notice not with a little hum, a little quiet song in the shower. With loud singing, it says, doesn't it? Loud singing. God takes pleasure, the psalm said. The Lord takes pleasure in his people. And so there's great judgment here. There's great condemnation here. There's all these words of law and all these words of death and destruction and sin and hard-heartedness and people won't turn, uh, won't turn back to God and, and God, as it were, frustrated by them. And, and so God has another plan. And God has a plan of the gospel. He sends his son, Jesus Christ, into the world to live perfectly in your shoes, to do everything that you cannot do for yourself, to die upon the cross, to die for the sins that you cannot pay for by yourself, and to be raised up, and to raise himself up, in fact, from the dead, to demonstrate to the whole world that he's mighty to save. And he leads us upward, and he leads us forward, singing and rejoicing over us. Just that little phrase itself should bolster our faith, should fill our hearts with joy and gladness, and should lead us out in utter confidence that God, the God of creation, the God who spoke and everything came into being, the God who saves sinners actually rejoices over me with loud singing. Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you and we bless you. For your amazing love and grace in Jesus Christ. You've done everything for us and we owe everything to you in utter sheer gratitude. And so send us forth in the power of your Holy Spirit to sing, to shout, to rejoice, to be glad that you are mighty to save. And we pray, Lord, as we even meditate upon this morning, we pray, Lord, that you would move us to pray even more for those who are still dead in their sins and trespasses, those who still are walking in the ways of the world, and those who are uh, possessed and even uh, controlled by the prince of the power of the air. But we know that Jesus Christ is more mighty. He's Lord, he's King, and he's alive. And we ask this in his wonderful name, and all of God's people say, Amen. Let's uh, sing together.